Thank you all for coming uh, and uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for invitation and for allowing me to, to speak about uh, something that, um, well, it's not going to be a particular result, but some area toward which I was drifting when moving uh, to the UK uh, from France. So uh, this, are, uh, this is a group of subjects, uh, again, a little bit uh, connected to fluids, of course, but more and more into the direction of uh, kinetic theory, which is uh, a domain that is uh, uh, very intensively being um, um, expanded in, in, um, in, in the UK, not only in London, but also in Cambridge and Oxford. So um, I will start from very basic things, uh, and uh, uh, probably it will be quite elementary for you, but I, my intention is to end up with some sort of list of open problems that I want to work on, and uh, I'm trying to make some progress on it. Uh, but as I said, most of them are still open. So I'm sure that you saw a lot of better pictures. Uh, if I, uh, if I would like to be like uh, in, the, in the canon of pictures in kinetic theory, I should draw a picture of bed that watches other beds, but I'm much better with fish. So uh, what, we want to, what we want to do is to derive some model that allows us to describe interactions between individuals. And unlike in the fluid equations, our individuals, our agents, are not just uh, stupid particles. They are individuals that can see each other and uh, adjust the reaction uh, toward uh, the sensorial um, effects or maybe sound or maybe they have some kind of um, uh, they, they can feel the, the motion of the fluid around them and that's how they decide what to do with their position and velocity okay and this is very very classical approach so when uh, so there are these three ranges of interactions three zones so when the two individuals are far away from each other well, for example, this is what you see on um, uh, discovery channels when you watch the, the shoal of fish. They try to attract each other, right? okay? So this is so, like sort of long range attraction force between them. When they are too close to each other, they try to avoid collision. So they immediately switch on uh, repulsion, okay? So there is short range repulsion. And somewhere in between, when they are maybe in some optimal distance or maybe even far away from each other, they try to align their velocities. So there is a, a third force, which is called alignment. And if we talk about, let's say, ensemble of N particles or N agents, so I is from one to N, these forces can be described uh, by some potentials. And this is, again, very basic, basic approach to the subject. So, uh, uh, the attraction repulsion force can be described by gradient of some potential K, which incorporates both of the effects, attraction and re repulsion. Yeah? Oh, yeah. So it depends on position of, uh, on mutual position of the particles. Well, it can be symmetric, it doesn't have to be. So it doesn't depend on the modulus here. The second force is something uh, that models alignment. And the indexes here stand for Cooker's male. So that's a Cooker's male force. And it's described by the, uh, by the weight or interaction kernel uh, phi that tells you uh, that there is some weight associated to exchange of the velocities between individuals j and i. Okay? So what you do in order to describe the, the, the motion of, of a group of particles, you write, um, well, the, the naive approach would be to write Newton second law that allows you to describe precise position and precise velocity of each of your particles. <coughs> OK? So of course, in the reality, the number of individuals is growing to almost uh, well, to very large sizes. And this type of description is not very practical. So what people came up with is some kind of mesoscopic description, uh, on, on the contrary to the microscopic description that gives you precise position and precise velocity of each individual. 
So you can use various techniques to derive the so-called kinetic models, which are Vlasov type of equations that give you a PDE for distribution of some probability uh, that tells you what is the chance that you will meet at some point of time and space an individual with velocity v. Okay, so it's Vlasov equation, simple transport equation, and you can derive it using, well, BB, uh, JKY hierarchies or mean field limits. And there are a lot of really great names associated with this subject. So for example, um, Carillo, Toscani, Tadmor, um, for us here, these are people um, working in this field to, to derive such uh, mesoscopic description uh, rigorously, okay? Well, the reduction that we obtain is quite significant. So what we get from here, yes, when m goes to infinity, we get equation for f that depends on t, x, and v, plus v uh, times gradient of f, plus, let's say, divergence f of f, f is equal to zero. So this equation, this is a PDE, we have the form of the force that is inherited from the microscopic model, okay? So, okay, we have now one PDE uh, to solve, um, to replace the uh, infinite number of ODEs, but still our unknown depends on time x and v. So if we work in 3D, we have, uh, we have much higher dimensions that we are used to, right? So the next step is to coarse grain the model even more. What you do is you take the moments of this equation and you integrate them. Well, you, you get the moments of this equation and you derive what is called macroscopic description, where I think all of us feel quite safe. So um, integrating the moments So we can introduce the so-called macroscopic or average quantities, and the density is just integration of f dv. Macroscopic velocity is defined by the second mo by the first moment. Okay, and if we do it like that, we obtain the system of conservation equations. So first of them is just continuity equation. So that's a simple exercise. Of course, everything is very formal here. The second equation is the Euler equation plus gradient of some function p. And on the right hand side, we have our, um, we have our force f, okay? So um, everything is fine. Everything uh, looks like given except for this function p. So p, if you make this computation, it is given by the integral v uh, tensor product u, uh, sorry, v minus u, tensor product v minus u, dv. So you see that this system of equations is not given explicitly as system of unknowns rho and u because it depends also on v. So it's not a closed system. And now in order to close it, you need to make some ansatz. Uh, well, again, this is on formal level, that will lead to different forms of this P. You do this also uh, for, the, for the kinetic equations leading to, to uh, fluid equations, but here what we are going to consider are two types of, two types of assumptions. So ANSATS is something that tells you that, in fact, you are working in a regime that is a bit more, uh, that has more information that you expect uh, from the beginning, from the modeling. So assuming, for example, that your velocities of individuals, so the velocities vi's, are close to the average velocity u, okay? So assuming that your distribution is actually rho times delta centered at u, okay? There is an f somewhere in the form of p. Yes, yes, there should be f. Uh, now, is it 1f or 2s? Okay. One, 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 yes. So, of course, now, if we, if we make this assumption, all right, so we have a uh, function f that 
depends on, uh, that is just given by the density basically, and all velocities um, are aligned with the macroscopic velocity, we call this ansatz uh, the um, monokinetic ansatz. And this leads to P equal to, uh, to zero, basically. OK? Uh, the other type of ansatz, so this is monokinetic. And this is quite typical. Um, uh, so to, to say a little bit about how to, uh, uh, who, who is related, to, who, who is working in this subject. Uh, so this, this has been uh, proven rigorously by uh, Kang and Figali. Figali. And I think like, um, 2017 or 18. The other type of ansatz is isothermal ansatz. Ansatz. So this is something that we see also for uh, when we derive the system from the Boltzmann equations with the collision operator. So in this ansatz, we assume that uh, the distribution of the particles is close to something that we see in equilibrium, which is basically Gaussian. So again, we have F equal to rho times Gaussian. And this leads to isothermal form of the pressure. So P equal to rho. OK? So there are two, two types of ansatz that uh, we are interested in when we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, the fluid equations or hydrodynamic equations derived from the from the microscopic description of uh, interacting agents. And uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about analysis of such systems. Uh, in one dimensional case, maybe I will give you some extensions to multi-D if time allows. But what is important here is to notice that, um, uh, well, this system, uh, maybe let me, let me make some remarks about form of the force. So the force. So as on the microscopic level, I have uh, two types of forces. So again, attraction repulsion force would be given by gradient of K convolved with rho. So K is my uh, interaction, uh, attraction repulsion force uh, potential. And the other force would be given by, um, OK, I'll write it uh, maybe explicitly, so phi. Uh, Let's say y minus dot, and now, uh, so this is u now, y minus u dot, and I think rho y dy. I never know about the sign, plus or minus, maybe Piotr Mucha will correct me if, he, if he's not asleep. So this is, uh, this is the ty two type of forces that we have, uh, attraction repulsion, and, uh, and alignment. And now, uh, depending uh, on, this, uh, on the, on the, on the um, forces, on the potentials, uh, on the communication weights, regular, uh, well, justification of the limit or is, uh, is uh, more difficult or uh, less difficult or can be actually done. So in case of the, uh, the isothermal ansatz, I forgot to say that this was done a little bit earlier, actually, than this ansatz. And this was proven by um, Car Carper, Millet, and Trevisa. And Carper, Per, Millet, and Trevisa. All of it is based on some uh, sort of relaxation limits that lead to this sort of system. So as I said, there is a church of people working uh, on the analysis of such systems. There is another group of people working on the first order model. So if you uh, if you like, uh, try to express uh, the velocity from this equation as a function of the density, you could plug it into the continuity equation, and you obtain uh, some sort of uh, non-local diffusion equation here. Okay? So there are people working only on the, on the first order reduction of the systems, which is really good for us because then we can compare uh, the, for example, asymptotic results for both models. They should be the same. Yeah? Okay, so... Um, before I actually go to formulation of uh, what I was uh, doing so far, let me comment a bit on the last ingredient, ingredient, the alignment force. So what is this phi? Well, this phi is something that tells you uh, 
how, how quickly or in what range the velocities are being exchanged. And it can have different forms. What, for example, if I take phi equal to, well, what I can write here is yes, that it's phi convolved with rho times u minus u phi convolved with rho. Sometimes we call it double convolution because of that. And uh, if, if you look at the, at the force, it is always coming with another weight, rho of x here, OK? So all fours all together would be density times, uh, times this potential. And now, if I, for example, take phi equal to, equal to, to 1, OK? So what happens is that I just integrate the momentum. And if I assume that my initial momentum is equal to 0, this is a conservative system, then, then this would be 0, OK? And from this term, I would get minus u times initial mass, assume it's 1, OK, or any mass that is conserved again. It is equal to 1 minus u times rho, OK? So if your individuals are able to sense each other everywhere with the same intensity, this term is just linear damping, OK? So then rho times f is minus rho times u, so a friction term, OK? But uh, we can think about a completely opposite situation. So what happens if the individuals like, uh, have, um, uh, they, they, they stronger and stronger align their velocities the closer they approach each other. So this uh, okay, models the situation that they really try to uh, hardly avoid collisions when they are too close to each other. And this corresponds to phi that is very singular. So um, phi is uh, singular around 0, OK? So let's say that phi is proportional to something like x to some power minus alpha. So there are a lot of works uh, uh, devoted to this, uh, uh, to this uh, kind of potential. It's, again, some kind of side of the spectrum, because no, uh, the, the original Cooker's may work assumed that this potential doesn't blow up in zero. But now the trend is really to include singularities, strong singularities in zero. And this uh, path from the particle description to the kinetic and macroscopic description uh, is something that, uh, well, you can trace uh, or if you are interested. Uh, we have a chapter in the book together with Piotr Mucha and Jan Peszek and uh, Piotr Minakowski on how to do it for very singular potentials like that. It's based on a couple of the, of the works of my co-authors. All right, but interesting thing again, and I want to link this potential to something that will be very familiar to some of uh, you who work on the degenerate uh, Navier-Stokes equation, is that this term is actually a source of dissipation that has a very nice form, OK? So um, let me maybe, OK. So a comment on the singular alignment. So let me define operator capital gamma to some power, uh, I think we, uh, we use so this is delta and this is gamma. OK, that's good. So this is minus Laplacian to gamma divided by 2. So a fractional Laplacian, which would be, OK, so I apply it to some function f, let's say. f has nothing to do with the previous function. So this is c uh, gamma f of x minus f of y. And again, the sign is gone. x minus y to the dimension a dimension was something already d, let's say, d plus gamma. So this works for gammas between uh, 0 and 2. Okay. So if my interaction, uh, if my uh, communication weight phi is given by this, um, by this, uh, by this fractional uh, Laplacian here, so I didn't write, what I should write on the right hand side is multiplication by rho x, rho y, integrate with respect to y, and I get my right hand side, okay? So 
this leads to some sort of fractional dissipation in the mm -hmm. equations of compressible flows. Okay. More like formally, I know I can, I'm not allowed to do it, but if, let's say, gamma divided by 2 times to 1, what we obtain from here is some sort of Laplacian. And in fact, it was observed by the Schwitko, by Schwitko and Tadmor, I think, in one, or maybe Doi as well, uh, that uh, you can introduce a quantity, which is Vx, which is equal to um, Ux uh, minus this uh, fractional dissipation of, uh, of the density. So I don't want to write this. I want to write to um, uh, rho x. No, just rho. So this is equal to um, ux plus right rho xx for us if gamma, again, tends to 2. And this quantity, this quantity Vx, I think they call it E in their paper from energy, satisfies the, um, the conservation equation. So what, was, what would be maybe even more familiar for you is that the new velocity V, the, uh, the, the effective velocity V, will satisfy um, just transport equation. OK, I will write it. I, sh I should actually write it in, in one dimensional case here, because in, in multi-dimensional case, it is a bit more complicated. So now our system, if we, if we go through all this uh, series of uh, very, um, uh, very formal arguments, now our system reads like that. So dt rho plus dx rho u is equal to 0. And if you plug in what v is from this equation here, okay, you integrate this equation, assume that something nice happens at the boundary, then you obtain from here the familiar Navier-Stokes equation without the pressure. <coughs> and with density-dependent viscosity that vanishes together with the density going to 0. Okay? So our system is now the Navier-Stokes equations <coughs> the pressureless Navier-Stokes equations with density-dependent viscosity coefficient, at least in 1D. In multi-D, it's a bit more, um, more complicated. And I think, uh, OK, uh, this is a good moment. Uh, so yesterday I was talking to Raphael, and uh, he has told me that if I will not mention uh, the best of spaces at least once, I will have to pay for the hotel from my pocket. So <laughs> actually, there are some results also from this fractional dissipation in the multidimensional case, so in the multidimensional Euler system with fractional dissipation uh, for compressible case. And the only result I know is actually by Raphael, Piotr, and uh, Peshek, and there is a fourth author, um, I think uh, Bartosz something, but I can't remember the, the surname. Wrublewski, thank you, voila, Polish author. Uh, and, uh, and they proved uh, the existence of solutions close to uh, some equilibrium in the critical, uh, in the critical spaces. So that's, that's a nice result. Uh, and as I said, the only result that I know so far. The rest of the results are devoted either to incompressible case or so the constant density case, or maybe one-dimensional results. And I'm also going to talk about one-dimensional results right now. OK, so let me try to wrap it up and tell you what we are going to, to work on first. So the first uh, kind of. Um, what I felt was an exercise when I came to, to Imperial was to try to think about um, this system with explicit form of the right-hand side. So um, the pressure is gone, so it's a pressureless system. Uh, and uh, well, I have the attraction repulsion term and uh, a linear uh, friction, which corresponds to, to constant alignment. Yeah? 
So what I wanted to find out, and it's all in 1D, so let me write it in 1D. For, let's say, omega zero being either interval or uh, the whole line, what I wanted to find out is whether this system has solution and what kind of pattern uh, can we get as a solution to this system, right? Because it's really important for us to understand whether the macroscopic models are actually fit to describe what we want these models to describe. So achieving some consensus or uh, creation of some patterns that we see for microscopic systems for like a um, small number of individuals, yeah? So we want to recreate that. Consensus would mean that all particles move in one direction, maybe, with the same velocity, and uh, that there is some like, homogeneous distribution, there is some nice pattern, okay? So we want to check whether something like this is possible. Yes, K convolution with rho, and uh, I, I said that we work with explicit form of K, and indeed, uh, so what we focused on was uh, so this is a Newtonian repulsion term and quadratic attraction, okay? So explicitly given in one dimensional case. And now, yes? Uh, in your drag term here, which is the alignment term. Yes. Uh, so here it's like the, the, the final uh, aligned velocity is zero. Where in the rezoning, I mean, it's like a, a change of frame. Yes, I could so like. Wh where in the rezoning is it involved? I mean. So uh, w this time will, of course, cause that uh, in the long time asymptotic limit that the velocity will be damped to zero, yes? But we can have uh, convergence to any constant velocity. So the, 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 the pattern that we produce could move with like constant velocity along the axis, no uh -huh. problem. But here, for simplicity, we have zero, and that's, um, that's one of the ways how to achieve it. So. Okay, so we have system like that, and it actually, well, of course you can start with like uh, short uh, time uh, solutions, you can prove that they exist, but we are actually interested in what happens for like long times, right? What sort of uh, patterns can we see? So we are more interested in, uh, in, in strong solutions right now, yeah? So um, it actually turns out that this system is really nice and it can be reduced to, um, to something, to, to an ODE that can be solved uh, immediately in three mm. different regimes for the initial conditions. So let me, let me show you because it's nice computation and it's good kind of uh, sport activity. Uh, how much time do I still have? Uh, 15, 15 minutes, okay. So not too much of calculations, but uh, let me explain you what we do. So in order to, to look at the, at the strong solutions, we uh, immediately move to the, uh, to the Lagrangian reformulation of the system. So, well, not Lagrangian, but uh, to the system of tra on the trajectories. I know that here Lagrangian means mass coordinate, so it's not the same, almost the same. Uh, e theta of x is equal to x. So this reformulation, uh, well, this change of variables actually allows me to move from the free boundary problem, perhaps, if omega zero is just the interval, uh, to fixed boundary, of course. I will only focus on axes that are in my initial domain where all the characteristics start, okay? So if I do this and introduce notation, tx is equal to rho t on the characteristic, and uh, v, tx is equal to u t eta tx. So also on the characteristic, what I obtain basically for free from this equation is explicit formula for f. So this is eta x is equal to rho zero. Okay, so, uh, just a change of variables. From here, what I obtain is um, I will change variables and uh, divide by the density at the same time, okay? So what I have is V prime plus, so V and, and this funny letter are the same actually, plus V, so that's, that takes care of all these terms. I will have one more term to deal with, is equal to,
So it's equal to, uh, well, my convolution, of course. So this is eta tx minus y rho of y dy. OK, and now I can quickly change the variables again. So substitute for y. So this is integrated over omega t, which is evolution of my domain. Yeah? I can substitute for y, uh, eta of t of y. But then I will have to multiply everything by the Jacobian of the, of the transformation, which is fortunately ny. And after that, I know that ny times f gives me rho 0. So this is altogether omega 0 d k eta, well, tx minus eta ty rho 0 of y dy. So I have very nice ODE with maybe integral on the right hand side. What I do next is I try to get rid of the integral, of course. So I will use some properties of my potential k right now. What I know for sure, well, except for the, uh, for the, except for, for the explicit form, I can see that this is symmetric, OK? So the derivative will be anti-symmetric. So 2 sine of x plus x. And the second derivative would have a delta here and the one coming from here. So delta is really good because uh, whenever I have some difference and delta, it will give me 0. Okay? So what I do next is I take another time derivative of this equation. So I'll have second derivative here, first derivative here. I'll have second derivative here. Sorry for the method I'm using, but I need to save some time. So eta ty multiplied by the time derivative of whatever is inside, OK? So this is actually, this is v of uh, time x minus v of ty, rho 0 of y dy. OK, and now if I plug in uh, what is k, I get from the first term 0 here, and from the second term something that is, well, sort of related to the momentum. Then I can express this integral of momentum going back to the momentum equation. And I will get some sort of uh, term that uh, decays exponentially with time. So altogether, altogether this will lead to the equation uh, for v of this form. So m0 v is equal to some m1 e to the power minus t. Where m0 is in mass, m1 is initial momentum with some uh, uh, exponential decay that comes from, the, from our linear damping. And now basically what you do is you solve ODE. So you have, uh, uh, you have three cases of uh, the solutions. And uh, you check what are the assumptions on your initial condition to end up in one of these regions. So our theorem with uh, Carillo Choi, so theorem Carillo Choi Zatorska says only this. So first of all, there we could identify the sharp thresholds for existence or um, for global in time existence or finite time blow up of solutions to the system, OK? So sharp thresholds. Mm. For existence of C1, C2 solutions to system star. So this is, this is system star. Second uh, type of result is that we were able, and again, in this, uh, this uh, coordinates, we were able to identify the uh, long time asymptotic limit pointwisely. But if we come back to the Eulerian description, we only get some sort of weaker result. So we could show that for global in time strong solutions, Of course, u converges to u infinity, which is equal to 0 in our case, 
and rho converges to some asymptotic profile, let me call it uh, rho infinity, only in L1 norm uh, and uh, with some, uh, well, maybe let's write it like that, uh, for some constant c and lambda that depend on, well, um, basically uh, initial conditions, of course, but the initial conditions involve uh, L infinity norm for the density, but also norm for the gradient of the velocity, L infinity norm for the gradient of the velocity, and of course, all the integrals. So what is rho infinity? Rho infinity is basically given by the initial mass. It's a step function supported on some interval, let's say uh, gamma minus one, gamma plus one. And again, the width of this interval is determined by the initial data. There is some formula for that. You can read it in the paper. All right, so having this, uh, we were interested to understand a little bit more what happens to the system. So we did some numerical simulations and we actually checked that the, uh, that the three conditions for the initial data that we obtain in analysis of the ODE give us uh, non-empty sets for the conditions. And indeed, you can uh, look for initial conditions that lead either to global in time existence of solutions. So this is all for the fixed initial domain, interval zero one, okay? All in the Lagrangian coordinates. So if you start with some density profile, which is wide curve, which is uh, a descent, and not too steep velocity, like that, the wide curve, well, after some time, actually quite short time, your profile will reach the, uh, well, reach the characteristic function of the full interval here, okay? And the, the velocity will converge to zero. <coughs> if you want to look for a short time blow up of solutions, what you are interested in is to find some points in your initial domain. So the density profile can be really the same, but you need to have very steep velocity uh, very steep velocity, at least in one point. So what happens is that the mass, well, has no time to relax. It accumulates in one point. And finally, uh, in some time t star, you have a blow up of L infinity norm of the density here. And of course, uh, you see it also in the gradient of the velocity, so it's, you have a almost vertical uh, tangent here. And uh, okay, we saw something like that. But uh, as the people not very experienced in numerics, even after achieving the blow up, we decided to run the simulations further. And it turns out that the, that the density profile somehow bounces back. So it is very short blow up, it bounce, bounces back, and your solution relaxes to this finite profile anyway. So no matter what your initial conditions actually are, this system gives you achievement of the consensus. You may have some like uh, concentration on your way or not. So we wanted to understand it a little bit better. And the first idea that we had, uh, five more minutes now, <laughs> was uh, that maybe we should approximate the system with uh, something a bit more regular. And of course, uh, the first guess would be to use the systems with dissipation. So sort of uh, pressureless Navier-Stokes equations, yeah? And this is the second part of my talk, which will be very short now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Mm. So that's our system. It produces something interesting. We would like to understand it a bit better. <coughs> well, I'm not sure if we do already, but at least we found some interesting direction to go from there. So what we were considering later on, and this is a work with Carillo, uh, another Wrublewska, Wrublewska this time, Kaminska, this is one person by the way, and, and myself. Uh, so we consider the approximation of the system. So again, the continuity equation is the same. And then we have uh, momentum equation. Um, now I need a color. Minus, uh, let's say, <laughs> dx um, mu 
of rho, let's say some epsilon here, dx u plus dx p epsilon of rho is equal to our standard terms, the, the same that we had. Okay, so um, we wanted to, to consider um, a new epsilon of rho that is um, basically some function epsilon, let's say gamma, gamma minus one um, rho to gamma minus one, I think. Uh, no, rho two. To be on the si safe side, I will write epsilon C that depends on gamma, rho to power gamma, I think. And then P epsilon is just a standard uh, form of the pressure. So we actually started from it uh, and uh, uh, derived the form for the viscosity coefficient from it. So they are related. They have the same order uh, in the density, both of these coefficients. And um, what we showed is that this system uh, with density dependent viscosity and pressure <coughs> has a global in time weak solution, okay? A nice global in time weak solution which is uh, bounded in L infinity. Uh, it is a, a, a study in the, so omega zero is the whole, whole space case. Density doesn't have to be separated away from zero, so there are no bounds from, the, from below. Therefore, we have usual problem of appearance of vacuum and so on. So we proved that this system has a weak solution, and we also showed some sort of weak, strong uniqueness result between the solutions to the system and the, and the solutions to the limit system. So the main theorem is that there exists some sort of uh, a relative energy uh, functional. So let's say rho bar, you know what, I will, I will write V immediately and explain myself later on a little bit. So V bar, U, uh, rho bar is a solution to the, to the uh, limit system. And uh, we are able to show that uh, this uh, relative entropy functional that I will probably uh, show you in a second, is that the limb when t goes to, well, uh, limb when epsilon goes to zero of this is equal to zero, provided that the initial data for both of the systems are the same, of course, okay? Or they can also converge to one another in some sense. And now, what is the main uh, idea behind? The main idea is, again, to go back to what I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation, to this new velocity uh, that appears th to satisfy some sort of transport equation. So if you now plug in, if you now look for some velocity v that relates u to gradient of, um, of some function of the density. I don't remember exactly the, the constant right now here and the power. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's gamma minus one right now. If you look at the reformulation of the system in this, in this new velocity, if you carefully choose the form of mu epsilon and, uh, rho, uh, and, and the pressure, it turns out that this new velocity v satisfies exactly the same equation as your velocity u for the Euler system, okay? So v will satisfy equation without any dissipation and without any pressure, okay? So the main idea of the proof is to build the relative entropy using this new formulation. And what you obtain actually is that the relative entropy rho v, rho bar, v bar. So v bar is actually equal u bar because these are the same velocities. There is no dissipation. There is no extra term here, okay? So this actually measures the distance between the, the new velocities. So I will write u bar since we already know what it is, okay? Plus uh, some, uh, uh, let's say uh, epsilon dependent, um, I'll call it uh, h, uh, that measures the distance between rho and rho bar, but this term disappears. And then there is another term that allows you actually to conclude something, which is due to our non-local interaction. So rho minus rho bar, one half. Okay, so, uh, 
unfortunately, I don't have much of details to tell you what are the main difficulties in the proof of this theorem. Uh, but the paper is already available on the archive, so if you have any questions, please do read it and ask me on the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you.